Welcome to the Michael Paris Podcast. All right, and we are live. Welcome to 11.50 AM KKNW, Alternative Talk on Seattle Radio, and welcome to the Michael Paris Podcast. Today, I'd like to welcome Spencer David Coburn. Spencer is the founder and president of the American Hair Loss Association, a consumer organization dedicated to educating the public, healthcare professionals, and the mainstream media about hair loss. Spencer is also the founder and director of the IAHRS, the International Alliance of Hair Restoration Surgeons, a consumer organization that selectively screens skilled and ethical hair transplant surgeons, representing only the true leaders in the field of surgical hair restoration. The IAHRS's goal is to provide a safe place for potential patients so they can research a surgeon based on their skills and not their ability to buy public opinion through advertising. Spencer is also the author of the groundbreaking international bestseller, The Bald Truth, the first complete guide to preventing and treating hair loss, published in five languages and sold in every English-speaking country in the world. Spencer's second book, The Truth About Women's Hair Loss, What Really Works for Treating and Preventing Thinning Hair, has forever changed the way medicine and society look at this neglected epidemic. Spencer is also a contributing editor to the Consumer Digest magazine and WebMD. Spencer also holds a position on the scientific advisory board of biotech startup HairDX, which provides the first genetic test to determine the likelihood of developing male or female pattern hair loss. Spencer has been featured in many publications, including the GQ, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Men's Health, Men's Journal, Newsday, the New York Times, the LA Times, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, and the Washington Post. Spencer has also been interviewed by ABC News, NBC News, Fox News, CBS News, CBC News, and a whole, and a whole bunch of others. Spencer, buddy, welcome to the show. Michael, I really appreciate the invitation. I know that you have listened to, to me for a while and we've, we've known each other for a while. And I, I absolutely appreciate the invitation. I'm excited for you as well that you, you're doing this podcast. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And we have to ask the listeners to forgive us if there's any issues with the audio. We are having a bit of issues, but this is the best we can do during the COVID pandemic. And I am recording this from home, not from the studio. So jumping on to the first question, Spencer, what is hair loss? And why is it so important to the younger generation, the older generation? And does it affect just men or does it affect women as well? Okay, well, that's a big, that's a broad question. And I'll try to answer it as best as I can. You know, I mean, when we think of hair loss in general, you know, obviously there's different types of hair loss. But, but what we see normally, what we see on, uh, on a daily basis is usually androgenetic alopecia or common male or female pattern hair loss. It is a, a genetic condition that really can happen to anyone once they reach puberty. Usually it obviously runs in families. The vast majority of men will see some degree of hair loss by the age of 35. And about 40% of hair loss sufferers who suffer with androgenetic or common hereditary hair loss are women, which people don't really recognize. But it's in incredibly common in women as well. Why does it affect us? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, it affects everybody differently, but I always say this, especially when I first started to lose my hair back when I was like 21 years old, when I noticed it, it kind of felt like I was unable to communicate my, myself to the world or communicate to the world in the manner in which I was used to. And I always liken it to kind of losing a portion of your vocabulary. And all of a sudden you can't communicate. You can't speak to the world the way in which you're used to, to speaking. And that is what happens when we start to notice a, a significant change in our appearance. I mean, it is probably one of the most profound changes people will see naturally in their appearance, especially at a relatively young age. And um, the way we are perceived or people with hair loss are perceived by others, the way we perceive ourselves, it is a, an incredibly life-altering and life-changing life event. For some, they're able to kind of just shrug it off, deal with it and say, well, look, it's, it is what it is. Or maybe they were, you know, thinking that, it was a possibility in their lives because they saw their fathers or their brothers or their uncles dealing with it. Right. And then there are others like most of us who really aren't equipped emotionally to deal with the onset of male or female pattern hair loss. And it affects us greatly emotionally. And, and again, to different levels, you know, I mean, uh, there are different levels of the spectrum, but some people are, their lives are destroyed by it. And there's some people who just, it takes them time to, to kind of get used to it. And some people are just better equipped to deal with it than others. Right. And it's truly a matter of self-perception. If you're okay with it, then 
this will never be a problem for you. And if you're not okay with it, then, you know, fortunately there are limited options at your disposal. But before we talk about treatments, I kind of want to talk, talk a little bit about the underlying mechanisms of hair loss biologically. So we have two elements that, that seem clear to us so far. Primarily there's DHT. So our body produces testosterone, which when it's in this free form gets converted to uh, one of, uh, gets picked up by one of three enzymes, your A reduct alpha A reductase, alpha B reductase, and an enzyme called aromatase. For the two alpha A and alpha B reductase, when testosterone hits it, it gets converted to something called DHT. And for the third, when your testosterone hits it, it gets converted to estradiol or estrogen. Now, in the first two cases, we've learned that if we block both of those enzymes, we see substantial progress in reversing or dealing with androgenetic alopecia. For the first enzyme, alpha A reductase, it's known to be needed for a lot of use cases, but less so in alpha B reductase. And we notice if we just block alpha B reductase, we see really good results and it's the best option for being the least hormonally invasive. And that's found in the form of something called finasteride. Now, the next case is where you have inflammation in the scalp and caused by a protein called PGD2, which essentially suffocates, it's called calcification, where it suffocates the blood vessel that need, that's needed to obtain oxygen and nourishment for the hair, and eventually the hair miniaturizes. Now, those are the two main causes that seem to be so far, and you know, you can talk about those and what you think about DHT and PGD2. Well, I definitely know, listen, the, the fact that it's both, um... You know, science discovered this a while ago, and we know how DHT affects, you know, people who are genetically predisposed to male pattern hair loss. Now, if you're not genetically predisposed, if you're not in that perfect storm, you could have incredibly high levels of DHT. You could have complete conversion of testosterone to DHT and, and not worry about the enzyme 5 alpha reductase type 1 or type 2. And your hair is just not susceptible to miniaturization from DHT. However, the reason it's called androgenetic alopecia is because it essentially is a perfect storm. Your genes are what trigger the miniaturization of your hair follicles once they are affected by those androgens. And essentially, it's like a switch. There's a timer. And the minute you are born, that genetic switch is waiting to be switched on. In some cases, sadly, it happens as soon as you hit puberty. In other cases, depending on your genetic predisposition, as well as some other factors, but usually it's a combination of genetics from, from both sides of the family. You know, you can start later in life. I would say the average person begins the process, deals with significant hair loss, probably in their mid to late 20s. I know that seems young, but that's actually pretty average. About 20% of men by the age of 21 will have significant hair loss. Wow. So it's, pretty, it's pretty significant. About two-thirds of men by the age of 35 will suffer with some degree of noticeable hair loss. So a lot of it, or most of it, I believe, at least according to science and also the years of, of use of these medications, it's a lot of it relates to DHT, dehydrotestosterone, the byproduct of testosterone. However, you're right about the uh, PGD2. Uh, there was a study done in 2012 that kind of identified and it was a study that was published in uh, the journal Nature that identified that there may be a different or a separate process involved in male pattern hair loss. However, there have been no real effective treatments to address this process. And the main treatments mm -hmm. really address the hormonal effect of DHT, as well as, as far as anything that's topical, it addresses the miniaturization of the hair follicle through kind of like a dilation process with the use of minoxidil. Right. It's unfortunate because treatments, all treatments for hair loss, all the effective ones, seem to be, have been discovered by accident to treat something else. So specifically minoxidil, which is FDA approved, was initially designed to treat hypertension and finasteride was initially designed to treat something called BPH, benign prostate hyperplasia, people with enlarged prostates. And, you know, the same thing with, with even PGD2, where you know, there was a chemical compound called bimodoprost, which was initially designed to treat glaucoma. Then they realized that it made the eyelashes really thick, and then it was transformed into a commercial product called Tease. Right. But still today, there have been FDA trials, and they have been found at most to be slightly more effective than minoxidil, which, as you likely say, is simply a band-aid. Well, the thing, the thing is, you know, and why Latisse works and why bimodoprost, that's a tough one for me, works so well is because there's such a short life cycle when it comes to eyebrows and eyelashes. It's a right. totally different animal when you're talking about scalp hair. And that is something that science really had to learn. I try yeah. and, you can't just, and you can't just go to the shelf and buy by because in the studies they've done where they found it to be effective on the scalp, they've used potency 
20 times the initial magnitude of Latisse or 10 times, depending on the study. So yeah, let's dive right into the treatment, Spencer, because, you know, part of, you know, part of what you do that's so special is that you have a way of deciphering the good from the bad, the good surgeons from the bad surgeons, the good treatments from the bad treatments. And if you can, this industry is full of garbage where it's a snake oil industry and everyone is trying to sell you anything because they're capitalizing on people's vulnerabilities. Can you tell us which treatments are known to work that you can recommend and which ones we should stay away from? Well, first of all, I, I need to make it clear to everyone who's listening that, you know, this is about a close to a $5 billion a year industry. And 99% of all products and services that claim to stop or treat or prevent hair loss just don't work. They will not help you in any way. And sadly, we see new treatments being promoted online every single day. We also see treatments that are being promoted through other resources, like, you know, uh, believe it or not, television. They're still promoting some, some really crappy products. You know, there was a, the FTC actually cracked down on the snake oilers uh, back in the late 80s and took a lot of these snake oil commercials off the air, but things have kind of evolved to the point where it's almost like they're turning a blind eye to things now because of, right. you know, everything's on the internet. But yeah, I would say that's the first thing people need to know. If someone is selling an ebook out of their basement who's claimed to have uh, found the cure for hair loss, trust me, they didn't. If it's a product that works, it will be on the cover of Time Magazine or Treatment. And right. <laughs> the reality is when you look at uh, the drugs that do work, they were national news and international news and on the covers of magazines. And we're talking about minoxidil, which is, you know, been around for well over, you know, two, almost three decades or more now. Yeah. And um, originally in, in pill form, uh, which was, it was, the drug was called Lonitin. And it was a drug mm -hmm. used for high blood pressure. And they found, again, like you said, accidentally that people who were taking this drug seemed to grow more hair in different parts of their body, including their scalp. So they decided to see how it worked topically. And lo and behold, that was the first drug that was approved to treat hair loss because it was able to show that it grew some hair. But it was very, very a slight regrowth. It's a very limited regrowth, but it was still able to get approved. And, you know, the other drug that you were talking about was uh, finasteride. And that is really, as far as making hair loss history, that is the drug that uh, for the first time in history, Someone took this drug, they were able to actually stop or slow the progression of their mm -hmm. hair loss and maintain their hair, in some cases, indefinitely. And it was a real game changer. And 20 some odd years ago, 23, 24 years ago, when this drug was approved for hair loss, I really believe that by now we would have many more treatments and that would be 100% effective and that hair loss would be eradicated. But that has not been the case. And during this time... Yeah because a lot of people were concerned about adverse side effects uh, from drugs, which are really, to be honest with you, again, I'm not a physician, they're minimal at best. You know, there are companies out there who are still willing to take advantage of vulnerable hair loss sufferers and sell them anything just for hope. And that's what happens every day. So I think the key for your listeners is most of what you see out there doesn't work. If it's a natural product, it will not work for you. I wrote the first chapter ever on nutritional supplements when it com comes to hair loss. And I, about three years in after my first book was published, I publicly stated that I have to retract these statements because there is no long-term evidence that these products right. that are being sold, like saw palmetto or pygium africanium or stinging nettle, exactly. or, uh, work in any way when it, or in any meaningful way when it comes to treating hair loss. Yeah, so two things. It's really important to mention that finasteride's main function is blocking the conversion from, from, from testosterone to DHT, but there are many different pathways, and it's a complex process. And just because saw palmetto blocks DHT, it doesn't mean that it's going to offer you any benefits in terms of aesthetics and hair loss. It can, it can also only cause you damage by blocking DHT where it is extremely important. And on the next point, Spencer, can you please elaborate on different forms where people can take finasteride, for example, you know, Proscar versus Propecia, and the five milligram form, is it recommended? Do you recommend the generic versus the name brand? I got to say that I can't re recommend any medication because I'm not a physician, but I can tell you based on my right. experience, you know, what I take. I, you know, before finasteride was approved for hair loss as Propecia, I began using the drug Proscar, which was for benign prostate hyperplasia. Uh, it was a five milligram dose of finasteride, and I was taking the entire tablet every day. I had no recognizable adverse side effects. Um, I had a little bit of 
testicular pain at the beginning of my treatment. But the only effect that I had that I was aware of was that within about three months, it, it slowed the progression of my hair loss significantly. And I began to see uh, my hair change for the better, meaning that because it was uh, the miniaturization was reversing, I started to see some, some changes in the sides of the scalp and in the crown. And I started to see some filling in pretty early on in the, in the process. So I kind of remained on five milligram dose for the last 27 years or however long I've been taking it. However, I don't take it daily. I was able to, because uh, at the time there's really little research done on the drug. I took it before it was approved for hair loss. It was kind of trial and error for me as well. So I, as time progressed, I learned that it takes a while. Basically, when you load up on these medications, it can take a while once you stop for your DHT levels to get back to baseline. So I started to experiment with intermittent therapy just so I could have less of the drug in my body and that I also had room to up the dosage if I ever needed to in the future. So currently, I take a one milligram dose of thinasteride, which is a proscard tablet, once per week, and I use intermittent therapy. For me, that has worked. However, the normal dosage, and this is what, what Propecia was approved uh, as, is a one milligram dose of thinasteride. And for most men, about 86% of men in clinical trials who took a one milligram dose of finasteride, uh, they were able to stop the progression of their hair loss and see some regrowth. And I've seen some guys who've had some significant regrowth. But at least in clinical trials, only about 14% of the men taking the drug had no positive effects. And clinically, a very small percentage of people taking either drug either five milligram dose or one milligram dose, had any adverse side effects that you see written about all over the internet. Right. You know, it's careful. You, you got, we all have to be careful. And again, I'm not a physician. I have to preface that as well. But if you search the internet about any sort of drugs, and maybe more specifically finasteride, there is a whole world of, of scare that you, you know, you'll be introduced to. And it's important to understand that usually you only hear the bad experiences online, but at the same time, you know, it, I find this weird, you know, I've, after the research I've done, but people who are using an asteroid or BPH never really had these kind of issues that, that seem to have surfaced once it's been introduced for hair loss, where there is something called post asteroid syndrome, mm-hmm. where a very small subset, subset of people are claiming that once they even get off the drug, they're still experiencing um, certain side effects like lower libido or sexual dysfunction. Now... The problem, the problem is that that's, ahead, that's never really been backed by any exactly. true clinical trials. It's, it was backed by a survey once by out of the University of, I think, Washington, or, or maybe it was George Washington University. And, and that was it. And basically, the survey, which they said was a study, was a, uh, a survey conducted by a physician who was in contact with people who were part of a, of a website, who were members of a website, who all were suffering with the same adverse side effects. Right. So it, it, there were really no double-blind placebo studies that would cause or prove causal effect that I'm aware of. Exactly. No, 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 that's exactly what I read. And I read also as well that it was just full of inefficiencies. And it was a very, very questionable survey. And it wasn't even a, it wasn't respecting any of the scientific protocols. Um, that being said, so, you know, we can get back to, you know, in terms of what works, so people are looking for a plan. Minoxidil for men is prescribed at five percent in the form of Rogaine, and you have finasteride prescribed at one. I'm sorry, at one milligram um, in the form of Propecia. Now, on top of that, you know, keeping your scalp healthy and using antifungals like ketoconazole seem to be quite interesting. And what seems to have worked the best for most people is when they use these treatments in synergy. And the collective result seems to be a lot more effective sometimes than the individual result. My question to you, Spencer, is, is that when someone's trying to figure out what works for them, it's a long process because you, you don't just take the medication and see results the next day. Now, do they start all the treatments? Do they start one at a time? How do they isolate what works? And how would you recommend, as someone, or based on your experience, what have you seen was the best plan of action for people to get on a long-term plan and not you know, waste time on things that, that don't. Well, you know, the thing is, you know, when you're dealing with hair loss, everyone is panicking. So they want to throw the kitchen sink at it. And that's what a lot of physicians will recommend. Problem is, if you do that, you don't know what's working for you. So I always let my listeners know or my readers know that, you know, 
based on my experience, and again, I keep having to say, say I'm not a physician, uh, it makes no sense to throw everything at it once. I would always start with the hormonal approach because we know that's the most effective. So the use of finasteride at the lowest dosage possible. And, you know, give that, you know, six months to a year and see how well you do. It's very possible that that will stop the progression of your hair loss and maybe you'll regrow some hair and you'll be happy with that. If things aren't to your liking within a year, you could always add something to your protocol. That could be minoxidil. Now, as far as uh, using any antifungal uh, shampoos like uh, ketoconazole-based shampoo, whether it's prescription-based or uh, over-the-counter, you know, I would say if you're having any scalp or inflammatory issues, dermatological issues of the scalp, that could be beneficial during this trial process of finasteride. But again, you're adding something else to the mix. And to me, unless you actually right. have some sort of inflammatory issue that, you're, you know, that, that you need to address, you might want to hold off on that as well. So I always recommend to my listeners or tell them what I would do, and that is to start with what we know really works best and mm -hmm. move on from there. And there are also some topical preparations that physicians are compounding or having compounded of topical finasteride which seems to be having um, pretty significant effects for those who may have maybe worried about uh, systemic side effects from finasteride. What people have to understand is if it's working in any respect, some of that drug is, come, is getting into your bloodstream systemically. It's, it's getting into your body. It is possible even to put some, if you put something on topically that you can suffer potential adverse side effects. So I always tell people... You know, if I was starting all over again, I would do it the same way, except start with a lower dosage of finasteride. Interesting. And from what I've read online, that the reason why minoxidil was introduced or, uh, topically, but finasteride had a much bigger molecular structure and the absorption through the scalp was much weaker. So I, I do see that people are coming around to start using finasteride in its liquid form to, through the scalp. But I do wonder, should they use it alongside tools like microneedling to increase the absorption rates, or should they just put it on their scalp? And of course, there's something we should ask the doctor, but... Yeah, well, I, I, I would say that, you know, it really, it really depends. And there's a lot of people who have a, you know, I mean, listen, there's a lot of, you know, um, bro science online. A lot of guys who are talking about microneedling and you know, every gray label, you know, product out there known to man on message forums and on you know, on Reddit and, and everywhere else on, on the internet. Yeah. The reality is we know very little about the process of microneedling when it comes to hair growth. Uh, there is some data and some scientific studies that will show that it, it certainly helps in some cases. We do know if you're creating, creating micro abrasions on sheer scalp that is going to, if you, as far as the absor absorption of medication, yes, it's going to help medication absorb you know, more effectively. But, you know, it's again, you know, I mean, you're, it's just that you're adding another, another thing to the mix that you don't know you have to, and it may not be effective. Right. So right. to, to me, you want to start slowly, even though you're in a panic, but you want to start with what we know is a FDA approved and most of the most effective FDA approved route. Yeah, and I, I, I don't want to get caught into the low light laser therapy, but I do want to ask you really quickly. So it has, so another FDA approved process for dealing with hair loss is using low light laser therapy, bombarding your scalp with uh, light at very specific wavelengths. What's been found effective in terms of the science was 830 nanometers, 785 nanometers were two wavelengths that's really good results. FDA approved low light laser therapy at, I believe, around 635 to 650 nanometers. What has your experience been, Spencer, with low light laser therapy? And would you say that it's a good plan for people who want to deal with hair loss? So my, my personal experience is I have uh, decided never to use it. And, you know, I have been in, I'm in a position because I'm the founder of the American Hair Loss Association where, you know, every company wants our endorsement and every product, every service, every technology wants to be endorsed by the American Hair Loss Association. And uh, we've never really been able to do that. Now, I know there's a, there's a lot of physicians out there who I have a great deal of respect for, who uh, believe in the use of low-level laser light therapy for hair loss, and they're selling laser caps and laser combs and laser beams and laser this and laser that. And, <laughs> and, I, and I will tell you that I have asked, I've seen some anecdotal evidence, and well, you know, that's kind of like, 
it's almost like a misnomer to say I have anecdotal evidence, but I've seen anecdotal reports. I have seen some people who seem to be very happy and have spoken to people with this treatment. There is some clinical data, but here's the thing. Most of these lasers that are being sold are essentially the same. They just have different numbers of diodes currently in their mm -hmm. devices. The strength of lasers that you were talking about are essentially the same strength as a cat toy or a laser pointer. And, you know, all, all I can say is this. There are some caps out there that are being sold for $5,000, $3,000, $2,500, $1,800. If you really want to take a chance, what you need to do is you, you can find an FDA-cleared appliance or device, go to like one of these, you know, Alibaba or, you know, these, you look for Chinese laser caps. Make sure you have the right number of di di diodes. About 376, I think, is currently the, the magic number. One device has more diodes. And you can get one for probably about $150 and give it a, give it a try. Right. And what's important to understand here is that, you know, it seems like these are the kind of things you have to adapt long term. So maybe what seems unappealing about uh, the laser light therapy is that you have a cap every single day or whatever it is that's recommended as opposed to popping a pill once a day or putting something in your scalp before you go to sleep. So, you know, perhaps it can work somewhat effectively, but it's a strong commitment and there's no point of doing it for a week or two. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, everything comes down to compliance, right? So, I mean, it, it, to me, it's not a big deal to comply with, you know, wearing a laser cap in front of your television for, you know, for a half an hour or eight minutes or however long they are promoting that this their particular device needs to work. Right. right. I think that most people would be able to com comply with that. However, is it worth complying with? And is it really going to benefit you? There are plenty of people that say that it does. But I can tell you that it's, it's certainly nothing new. It's being promoted on television and other resources online as though these are new devices. They've been around since I've been in this game. They were not FDA cleared. But people kind of confuse FDA cleared with being FDA approved. With FDA approved. And yes. the only thing that's FDA approved are drugs, medication. FDA cleared is called 510K clearance. And all a device has to prove is that it meets a certain standard that a prior cleared device met. So mm -hmm. the hardest part to get cleared initially was the first, and I think it was the Hermac laser comb. They had to go through some, you know, some hoops to get that cleared, which they did. But every other device since, it was a relatively easy process. Now, uh, just to move on to PRP, platelet-rich plasma, the process of extracting one's own blood, putting in a centrif centrifuge, separating the red blood vessels and red blood cells from the, from the PRP, from the rich plasma, and then reinjecting the rich plasma back into the scalp and uh, inducing growth factors and regrowing hair. So that has been anecdotal for the longest time. And I do believe, reading up on some of your stuff, that you are becoming more of a, of a believer in that process. And if you can tell us more about PRP and if you recommend it. You know, I, I recommend platelet-rich plasma therapy as, again, as a, a treatment of interest that I have seen work for some people. The problem is not all, all PRP is created equal. So since right. essentially a, a PRP became the biggest money grab that this industry has ever seen in the last decade or day de or decade and a half. It started off very small. A handful of guys started to do it. There was a guy by the name of uh, Joseph Greco, PhD, who really did a lot of legwork and studies on this process and offered it in, in his clinic as a PA. And we saw some pretty significant results, but he had a very stringent protocol. And then a lot of companies started to create different PRP kits and different devices to be used and centrifuges to be used to create PRP. And, you know, there was really no protocol. There was really no, I guess the word would be kind of uh, across the board protocol. Physicians were essentially just drawing your blood, putting it into a centrifuge, separating the plasma from the blood. That, that's the problem with, you know, some scientific endeavors might work, but if you can't patent the process, there's little economical incentives for people, for big companies to jump on them. And, you know, it's really only drugs that seem to be getting patents. Well, that, so it's unfortunate. That's exactly true. So, so that's why I let people know, listen, not all PRP is created equal. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there 
and physicians out there who are jumping on this bandwagon, making it like it's just one simple treatment. You have to make sure that the kits are FDA cleared or approved kits. Well, actually, they're, they'd be cleared kits. You have to make sure that the practitioner is really a hair specialist who understands this process well. And for, sadly, there's only really a handful of guys in the entire country who are doing PRP to stay at the art standard right. and getting real results. And we I sent everyone down to Joe Greco down in uh, Sarasota, Florida, found another doctor here in Los Angeles who is really providing some really outstanding results as well. And there's just maybe a handful of guys. And even some of the doctors that I work with, I am not 100% sure as far as the, on the hair transplant side of things, I'm not 100% sure what their PRP is doing for their patients because I have not seen the results. So it's really difficult right. for me to recommend who to go to for PRP. But it is a viable yes. treatment and can help some people. Interesting. Now, moving on to the to the process of, you know, we take the medication, all that stuff, but for people who are experiencing more aggressive hair loss and people who, you know, these treatments might not work that well with, there are other options available. And one of them is surgically invasive, where you can do follicular unit extraction or follicular unit transplant transplantation. Tell us more about those. Oh, that'd be great. Well, the reality is, you know, hair transplant surgery really is a last resort, and it works for a certain candidate, and you really have to be a specific candidate to, to do well with hair transplants. Now, with that said, if you are the right candidate, you have the right hair characteristics, if you have the right donor characteristics or enough donor hair to be moved, if you're currently taking medication that has slowed or stopped the progression of your hair loss, Hair transplantation in the right hands can be an incredible, life-changing procedure. Sadly, as good as things got, you know, when I initially got into the field in around 1998, we really changed this field and kind of exposed it for what it was and made it a safer place for consumers, at least the surgical side of things. With the advent of follicular unit extraction, which is essentially what they're doing is, you know, with follicular unit transplantation, they would remove a strip of scalp from the back of your head of hair bearing tissue. And this would essentially be DHT resistant hair bearing tissue. They would suture that area back together, close it tightly, and the hair in the top and the bottom would essentially cover that wound in most cases. And then they would take that peninsula of hair and put it under a microscope or several microscopes after they slivered it up. And they would extract and dissect the liquid unit grafts out of that. And then that would then be placed mm -hmm. in the front of the scalp. With FUE, they were able to figure out a way to remove follicular units one at a time from the back of the scalp using very small punches, in some cases motorized punches. And now they're using robots, which, you know, uh, there's, also, uh, there's also a device called Neograph. But the, here's the reality. This is being sold now like a one-size-fits-all procedure especially with FUE. And everyone, because there are these devices being sold, everyone who has an MD or DO is trying to get involved in this and creating like ancillary income for their practices. Hair transplantation is probably one of the most difficult and nuanced and elegant forms of cosmetic surgery that there is. And there are so many limitations when it comes to it that not everyone with male pattern baldness or female pattern baldness makes a good candidate. And as a matter of fact, Less than 5% of women who have female pattern hair loss make good candidates for surgery. So I think the key is, it's great to discuss what, what it is and what the differences are, but I think what's really important for your listeners to know is that this is real surgery. This is not a walk in the yeah. park. This is not going to, you know, like getting some dental work done. If the physician and their team aren't truly skilled at this, and in most cases, they should, this should be all that they do, then it is not something to even consider. You have to find the right team and the right physician with the right skill set. And the tools that they use are only as good as the hands that wield them. So whether it's a neograft, whether it's an artist robot, people think, oh my God, robotic surgery. Yeah, that seems great. It seems cutting edge. But if that robot, if those parameters are not set by someone who knows what they're doing, and if changes cannot be made on the fly by a doctor who knows what they're doing, you're finished. You are disfigured for life. Right. Uh, and, you know, normally I would, this is probably one of the bigger part of the hair loss industry, but it's, my audience is a little younger, so I, I imagine this is less appealing to them at this time. But uh, just a quick question. I do wonder, for FUE versus FUT, which one would have greater scar tissue surface area? It's interesting that you say that because you would think everyone's concerned about the strip scar 
that's left behind from the right. FUT, you know, when they remove a piece of scalp. But even if you have one or two strips done or three strips done, if you have enough elasticity in your scalp, you can really have a relatively, as far as per square centimeter, you know, amount of scar tissue, small scar left behind compared to removing three or 5,000 individual follicular units where you have this, I'm not going to say a confluence of scarring, that could eventually happen if you have too many units removed. But as far as square inches or square centimeters, there will be much more scar tissue across your entire scalp with FUE. They're just tiny punctate wounds. Exactly. That's what I thought. Yeah, because yeah, sim- they sound like it's appealing. It sounds like it's tiny little biopsies, right. little punches. But they're doing you're doing that. You're doing multiple incisions as opposed to one. Uh, you're doing percent. thousands of incisions as opposed to removing mm-hmm. one strip that could uh, yield in many cases twenty five hundred, three thousand, some cases four thousand grafts. What a fascinating conversation. You know, now I'm just thinking ahead. So this has been an industry which has promised everyone in the next five years, everything is going to be solved every five years. And we're practically, from looking at the science, you know, the science has progressed. Our understanding of how hair function works has definitely progressed a lot in the past decade or so. But in terms of treatments, we've been rather stagnant. Now, looking forward, so companies like Histogen, Adirans, you can tell us about some interesting stuff we can expect. That'd be, that'd be super interesting. It would be interesting. But, you know, one thing, if you, if you listen to my program, is I, I try to avoid that now. You know, for, for years, it was obviously a big draw. But uh, the reality is that, you know, a lot of the information that comes out through these companies, through press releases, really are put out. You know, yeah, they're excited that they're making some progress. But... They have stockholders. They also want to create interest in their company. And, you know, until all I can tell you is that any movement done today, we are not going to see anything for years. I mean, there was something that essentially came out yesterday, right? I don't know if you, if you saw that, but, you know, it was, it was actually out of Harvard. Okay, so there was another study or breakthrough that was published in Nature yesterday, June the 3rd. And Essentially, and if you read up, you know, if, if you go and look it up on the news, you know, if you look it up in Google, it's, it's all these uh, headlines like, you know, baldness boost, cure for baldness on the horizon after scientists grew hair on mice using human stem cells. Well, this is another group of scientists that were able to actually show that they were able to manipulate stem cells that, uh, and the types of stem cells that essentially can turn to any tissue, grow them in a Petri dish, and then implant them onto or implant the skin that it grew onto mice who would not reject it, who reject these, uh, this tissue. And human hair grew at, at pretty good length and uh, pretty robustly on these mice. Now, that could be huge. It's, a, it's definitely a big breakthrough, but we don't know how long those hairs are going to cycle. We don't know if they're going to grow to full maturity. It's going to take years to fully understand this process and to bring it to, uh, to market. FDA can take 10 years. Yeah, but what, what this will do is, and I don't even think the FDA would have to be involved because it would be essentially they'd be growing tissue. I mean, they have to be involved to some degree, but it's not like a drug. But essentially what the hope is, is that they'll be able to create endless supply of DHT-resistant hair follicles that could be that then be transplanted or implanted into a balding scalp without you having to have the limited supply that you currently have with current state-of-the-art hair transplant surgery. So it will be huge. Is this being done by, by histogen? No, it's not. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so that sounds like, isn't that what histogen is doing, essentially? Just taking a biopsy, cultivating it, replicating the cell, the follicles, and then re-injecting them. Well, they're re- yeah, exactly, the- but it's not what they're doing. Basically, these people are creating hairs that can then be dissected and then implanted, uh, just like a traditional oh. hair transplant. But they would essentially grow skin, hair-bearing skin, outside the body or even on another oh, animal. Wow. Oh, I see. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Gotcha. And that hair would, here would not be rejected by you because it's going to it be your own cells. Right, I see. Yeah, so again, Spencer, I, I really appreciate your time. We're, we're way past the time we had initially hoped sure. to stay within, and I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> but Spencer, I have to say that I, I really thank you for your time. This has been super, super informative. And for those who want to follow Spencer, you can you know, put in your social media and website. Yeah, you can follow me on Instagram at Spencer Coburn, S-P-E-N-C-E-R-K-O-B-R-E-N. If you want to check out the show, you can go to thebaldtruth.com. And um, that's really it. AmericanHairLossAssociation.org is a good place for you guys to get some information. 
And that's, that's really all I got. Spencer, thank you very much. Stay safe out there and wishing you all the best. All right, Michael, listen, thank you so much. And I will talk to you soon.